for everybody who's with us uh, in-house. I'm so delighted to have you all here. Isn't it good to gather together like this? And uh, I know you guys are tempted to, uh, from time to time, be at home and watch us from the comfort of your couch. But I don't think there's uh, any substitute for this. Uh, however, we understand from time to time people do need to tune in from, uh, from home. And so for our online audience, we are really grateful to have you joining with us today. And this morning, I want to talk with you about being kingdom kids. Are there any kingdom kids in the room today? Look around here. Here we are, kingdom kids. And, you know, it's interesting. We've been uh, looking for several weeks here uh, at the parables and as Jesus gives us insight through his stories, through his parables, about what the kingdom of God is like, what the values of the kingdom are, we've learned that anywhere where God's values are on display, that God is honored as king of that kingdom, as Jesus is lifted up, that his kingdom is right there. That means his kingdom is here, amen, amen. right now. But one of the things you discover is that as he teaches about the values of the kingdom, what he does is he takes worldly values and flips them completely upside down. And in God's kingdom, children are deeply valued. And let me read out of Mark chapter 10. It says, people were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. Now, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. Would you say that word with me? Indignant. He said to them, Let's read the underlines together. Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, and he put his hands on them, and he blessed them. Now, I know in our culture... Um, we really do value children, don't we? It was very different in Jesus' time. In, G in the Greco-Roman world, unwanted children, they'd just be left outside to the elements, or maybe they'd be dropped off at the steps of the Colosseum where they would be abducted. Um, you know, they'd be raised as street beggars, maybe raised to be gladiators or, or prostitutes. And so when Jesus talks about the value of children, he, he's really talking about the value of human life. He's talking about the value of not only those that are mature and growing in their faith, but those that are new to their faith. And so people were bringing the little children to Jesus, and the disciples are rebuking them, rebuking the parents, rebuking the kids. And I can just tell you this, they weren't the last disciples that wanted to put up barriers in people being able to get to Jesus. Look what it says in Mark 9. It says, if anyone causes one of these, what's it say? Little ones. Any of these little ones who believe in me uh, to sin, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around their neck. Think about that. So when he's talking about little ones, who's he talking about? Well, he is talking about children, but he's also talking about the ones that are new to their faith. Don't burden them with all kinds of stuff that make it difficult for them to get to Jesus. Now, is there anybody in this room, uh, maybe you've said yes to Christ and it's been less than five years for you. Anybody? Okay, right here. Okay, so we have right here some ones that are, maybe scripture would describe as little ones or newer to the faith. And what we absolutely do not want to do is throw up barriers that make it difficult for you to grow in your relationship to Christ. Now, uh, he's not just talking about um, children here. He's talking about all kinds of folks, maybe poor folks, maybe people of color, maybe people that are struggling with addiction. Now, the disciples rebuked the children, they rebuked the parents, and it says that Jesus, what was the word? He was indignant. Does anybody have any idea what the word indignant means? It means angry. That's what it means. And I can just tell you this. Jesus is angry. 
when we make it difficult for people to get to him. And those disciples weren't the only ones that did that. Churches are still notorious for doing that kind of thing today. But Jesus invites all folks. Jesus reached out to the marginalized people. He reached out to the lepers, the the sinners, the Gentiles, the Samaritans, women, children, everybody. And Paul said this about this. He says that there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, that you are all one in Christ Jesus. Would you read that underline with me? You are all what? One in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that. Praise the Lord. So church planting, for those of you that that may not uh, be aware of this, I... My wife and I, along with the small team of folks, we planted this church um, going on 23 years ago. Jan- in January, it'll be 23 years, if you can imagine that. And, you know, we went to a church planter's boot camp. Yeah, there's really such a thing. It's where you go, you spend a week, and you kind of strategize on how you're going to plant, you know, this church. And one of the things they want you to do is identify the type of people that you feel called to reach, a certain kind of demographic. But, you know, I really struggled when we got to that portion of the boot camp because I really didn't see that that's what Jesus did. In fact, in his very first public sermon that he preached, look what he says. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to who? To the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to prisoners. prisoners. Uh, have any of you ever been imprisoned, maybe by your addiction, or, or maybe you were literally imprisoned? Anybody? Yeah, so the gospel's for you. Recovery of sight for the blind, that Jesus was initiating physical healing to release the oppressed. You know, when you read a passage like this, it doesn't look like he identified, you know, this certain demographic that has, you know, a certain kind of bank account, drives a certain kind of car, lives in a certain kind of house. Uh, You know, Jesus, it doesn't look like Jesus um, said, hey, just target the in crowd. Thank God for that. He said, target the out crowd too, right? Those that are in the out crowd as well. You remember the message I did several weeks ago where we talked about the kingdom of heaven is a party? Do you remember that message? And and he told the guys to go invite everyone, the good and the bad. Aren't you glad that everybody's invited, that we can all be a part of God's kingdom, all be a part of God's God's family? Can we give him uh, an applause for that? So let's talk a little bit about being kingdom kids. And before I get going too far with this, I I just want to remind everybody that the kingdom of God is something that you receive, you don't achieve. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say that God's kingdom is something you receive, you don't achieve. Now, we've talked about this, you know, We've talked about this before, but it's really true. It's important that we understand that. What's it say in Mark? Anyone who will not, what's it say? Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter into it. I want you to think about how does, how does a child receive a gift? How do they receive it? joy, eagerly. It's not something they throw in their closet and they're going to get to, you know, on some appropriate day. They are thrilled. And he says, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter into it. I don't know why this is, but for some reason, I don't know if it's our American culture. I don't know if it's just uh, adult culture in general, globally. But we kind of have this natural inclination of striving, that somehow we have to work for it, that we have to earn it. But what does it say in Isaiah? It said all of our what? All of our righteous acts 
are like filthy rags. It doesn't say all your sin is like a filthy rag. He's talking about your self-righteousness, your self-effort. Because the kingdom of God is nothing we could ever strive to get. We must receive. We must receive. We don't achieve it. We receive it. So here's the second thing. We must receive the kingdom of God like a child. So I asked you the question, how, how does a child receive a gift? You said joyfully, with enthusiasm, with eagerness. One of the other things I know about kids is children, they just know that they are dependent. They are utterly dependent on their um, parents. They can't defend themselves. They can't provide for themselves. They depend on someone else. Children do not have a plan B. Right? Children don't say, well, I think I'll try out mom and, mom and dad for a little bit, see how that works out. If that doesn't work out very good, I'll just kind of go ahead and take care of myself. It doesn't work that way. Take a look what David said in, in the Psalms. He said, my soul, would you say the word with me? My soul what? Clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. You guys, I, I love being a grandpa, and I love having um, Josiah really close, Joseph, Caitlin, close to us. And regularly, I get to have kind of a, a front seat um, view of this in operation because I, I don't know how it is or why it is, but Josiah just knows. He, he knows, hey, man, I need mom and dad. Okay? I can't do this myself. And so you see him cling to them. And in the same way, he wants us as kingdom kids to recognize our utter dependence on God and for us to cling to him, that we would cling to God, completely dependent on God. The third thing I want to talk about is this. For you to enter the kingdom of God, we must imitate the attitude of a child. And one of those attitudes is that children are humble. And Matthew, he says, I tell you the truth. Would you read this with me? Unless you change and become like little children, you, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom. You know, by, by nature, um, children are not arrogant. They walk into the room and they look at this crowd right here, and they would know, hey, I'm not the biggest, I'm not the strongest, I'm not the most capable, you know, I'm not the smartest in the room. They understand that. And he says for us to be able to receive the kingdom of God, we must have this, this attitude of a child where we recognize I'm not the smartest, I'm not the strongest, you know, I'm not the most put together. For us to receive what God has for us, we must humble ourselves to be able to receive it. Because he says what? That God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I love this story uh, Chuck Swindoll tells. For, for some of the older folks in the room, like myself, we recognize the name Chuck Swindoll, and he told this story about uh, children that had built this clubhouse, and they put the clubhouse rules on the wall there, and I love what it says, the, the clubhouse rules. Number one, nobody acts big. Rule number two, nobody acts small. Rule number three, everybody acts medium. I love that. That's kind of funny, isn't it? Everybody acts medium. See, a child understands I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. We're all in this thing together. We must all recognize, I need grace as much as you need grace. I need forgiveness as much as you need forgiveness. I need mercy as much as you need mercy. I'm not bigger. I'm not less than. We're all medium. We're all in the same boat. We all need what Jesus has done for us. Amen? Amen. So whether you're red, yellow, black, white, whether you're Indian, Irish, Dutch, Jew, or the little Norwegian too, it doesn't matter where you're at. 
We all need Jesus. And we must all humble ourselves and come before him because we're all in desperate need of the same grace, the same mercy, the same love, the same forgiveness. You know, there's a big difference between how a child receives a gift and how we as adults receive gifts. You know, I love when Christmas comes along where, you know, our, my favorite time of year, it's not that far away. My birthday's coming up as well. You know, I, I'm sure my wife will uh, get me something. I've already seen the uh, Amazon box come in. And so, uh, you know. But, but here's the thing about it. For, for us as adults, when we get a gift from somebody, the truth be told, it's usually something we could get for ourselves. Is that true? We could usually get that for ourselves. And so we always appreciate the gesture. We appreciate the fact that they thought of us. They, they, they didn't forget us and they got us something. But truth be told, you know, we could have got it for ourselves. But be, they thought of us and so they got us as something. But it's very different for a child. Somebody said that they're enthusiastic. They, they receive a gift with great joy. Why is it? Because they recognize, I could have never got this for myself. You know, you think about this back when, even if it was a barrel of monkeys or the game of operation or a rock'em, sock'em, or, what, or a new bicycle, whatever it was, you were so excited. And why is it? Because you could have never got it for yourself. And I remember as a child, I went down for uh, one Christmas, and there was a new bicycle. I was probably about six years old, and I go down there, and there was a brand new bike with a, with a bow on it, and my name, and ribbon on it, and there it was parked underneath the tree. I was so excited. I was so excited because I wanted a bicycle. I knew I could never get one for myself, but there it was. And even though there were some other gifts still under the tree, you know what I wanted to do right then? I wanted to take the bike out and ride it around. I wanted to get on it and ride it up and down the street. That's the way children receive gifts. They receive it with great joy, with great enthusiasm. And they don't want to just set it in the closet. They want to take it out and put it to work right then. And this is why Jesus says we must receive the kingdom like children do. That we recognize that we could never earn or work for the salvation that God has given to us. It is a free gift. This is not of ourselves. We can't boast about any of it. And so we want to receive the gift with enthusiasm, the gift with joy, and we, and we put it to practice right now. I remember when Joey was a little guy, and we actually had this on video. It probably would have been fun if we played the video, but it didn't matter what he got. Every gift he opened up, his eyes lit up like this, and he's like, it's just what I always wanted. It's just what I always wanted. Spider-Man underwear. It's just what I always wanted. A Tonka truck. It's just what I always wanted. And it didn't matter what the gift was, but he opened it with just such elation, such joy, such enthusiasm. Why is that? Because he knew it was something he could have never got on his own. He didn't have the job, he didn't have the money, and there was no way. And I want us to understand when it comes to salvation, when it comes to God's love, his peace, his grace, I want us to be able to be as enthusiastic or even more so than my son was when he was opening up a Tonka truck, that we realize, Jesus, this is just what I've always wanted. And we would receive it with such great joy. And it's not something that we would say, oh, that's nice. And we just go on about our business. Because the fact is, what he gives to us, we could have never given to ourselves. Amen? Let's give him applause for that. This is how we should receive the gifts that God has given to us. He's given us the greatest gift of all. I don't know about you, but I want to receive all that he has for me. And I want to receive it with enthusiasm. 
I want to receive it with joy. I want to receive it with, a, with an understanding that I am utterly dependent on him. There's no plan B. It's God and him alone. I want to receive him humbly because I understand that he opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And I want to be like a child that recognizes I'm not the biggest, I'm not the strongest, I'm not the brightest. I am utterly dependent on him and I receive all that he's given to me with such joy and enthusiasm. Amen. Amen. You know, I'm going to ask you this question just like I did earlier today with Breakfast Church. Is there anybody here today you've never opened up and received what he has for you? You've never said yes to him knocking at the door of your heart. He says, I'm knocking, but will you open? Will you open and say yes? Because if you will, I will come in. I'll be your friend. I'll be your Lord. I'll be your God. I will be your provider. I'll be your Savior. He'll provide everything we need. Have you opened up your heart to him? Maybe you have, but you've been out living in the back 40 somewhere. You've created distance between you and God. Well, I've got good news for you. Just like the song we were singing earlier today, he's pursuing you right now. He's pursuing you. I'm going to ask if we could bow our heads together. Would you like to commit your life or recommit your life to the Lord? Whether you're here in house or online, could you just acknowledge that by raising your hand this morning? Amen. Can we pray this prayer together? Dear Lord, I say yes to you. I receive you just like a child receiving a gift. I receive your goodness, I receive your grace. I receive you. Come in and be my friend and be the leader of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord.